Hello, son and daughter. Welcome to Old Texas Scare Podcast. I went on a group retreat type thing over a fall weekend about eight years ago. Husband and I and our three girls, all under age 10. This was an annual occurrence, but we were flush that year as a result of our company doing well. As a result, we avoided the communal bunkhouses and decided to rent a camper. The RV rental place explained that it would cost the same for three nights as it would for two, so we decided we'd return it on Monday, despite the retreat being over earlier on Sunday. So the weekend went great. It was super hot, and we were happy to have AC. We didn't notice it at the time. Different people being in and out all day, not staying in the RV much over the weekend because of activities. But the previous renters hadn't bothered to clear out the septic lines in the camper. By six Sunday evening, it stunk horribly and was backing up into the toilet. My husband was anxious about the rental company blaming us, so he decided to go to the Walmart in the neighboring town for some drain. Oh! Mind you, this particular location, while open all year, is rarely occupied outside of retreats. I'll confess that we haven't been back since this occasion, so the details of why don't really come to mind, but as I recall, it was privately owned by a church in the area, and they used it mostly for their own purposes and events. So Hubs leaves around 8.30 p.m. for Walmart. It's an hour plus round trip thanks to the rural area and skinny back roads. I start straightening the camper, packing our belongings and getting the kids settled. He'd been gone for about 40 minutes when I had gotten everything squared away and delivered the last glass of water to an overexcited child who'd been on the move all day and was having trouble relaxing. I curled up in the bed to read and wait for my husband to get back in case he needed help. The lights had been out for about 20 minutes when I started hearing a clicking sound coming from the window behind the bed. I still instantly and ran through a self-reassuring checklist. It's the trees scraping the glass. Nature, a sound. In the environment nearby. Or an axe murderer. That was an option, too. I got up and walked very slowly to the kitchen. The noise followed. As I was climbing up into the loft area over the truck can, I heard the door handle rattle, and then the scraping sound. I'd gotten a knife as I passed through the kitchen, which I was sweaty, clutching as I hulled down on the edge of the bed in the loft, guarding my children. I had the cabin, making sure every access point was locked and hoped whoever it was, it was definitely a whoever at this point, would go away. I leaned left and right, trying to get signal on my cell to call camp security or my husband or anyone, but it wouldn't dial. I waited, panicking. It was about five minutes of torture later that I saw headlights through the portholes on the side, coming along the winding road to the RV sites, and my husband entered the cabin, looking at me weird. He scoffed at me for being a city girl and told me that people didn't break out of prison and attack women and children in random rural campgrounds. I expressed that I'd heard the door rattling and that it wasn't a coincidence of nature, but he brushed me off. We passed the test of the night without incident, though I was too on, edged to sleep. The next morning we drove into the town to return the RV on the once. Over-demanded by the rental agreement, the manager came around to my husband and asked if he knew what had happened to the rear window. It seems that someone had used a switchblade or some similar item to remove the gasket from around the window where the back bedroom was, where I'd been reading the night before. There were gashes in the paint consistent with knife marks and the gasket had been sliced off. The window lock was also damaged. It seems whoever had done it. It also tried inserting the knife in the door's lock in between the jam and the lock in another attempt to gain entry. Fortunately, they didn't get in, and we were not charged for the damage to the RV. Needless to say, I never consented to a solo camping trip again, and always go in a larger group now. Safety in numbers and all that still makes the hair on my neck stand up. Hello, sir. 
I don't know if you were aware of this incident from the spring of 2018. The event affected all the inhabitants of a ranch located in the town of Los Cedrales, Paraguay, in the department of Alto Parana. The cold nights forced the inhabitants of the Manuela Ranch to shut themselves up early, but the tranquility broke at around 9.30 p.m. on the Saturday night when the guardian of the establishment, a little dog, would not stop barking. The administrator, Francisco Molinas, came out to look at him with his rifle in a flashlight. He went to investigate the reason for the alarm towards the place where the sheep slept. I went to look behind the shed and I saw one of the largest sheep lying on the ground. There I found out that there was every wound in the neck. I shined my flashlight to a corner and there I saw the bug with its red eyes. It was brownish in color. In total, the bug killed six goats. The man reacted to the initial scare and said, I got three shots with my rifle. I shouted to my son and he brought my Nanmem pistol, his hem the animal about 70 meters out there. Just when he stayed, I emptied the magazine of my gun and 16 shots. Then I led him with the line, and there he turned around and came straight to attack me. I reached my son and my partner, who brought a shotgun. The bug did not run so hard, and they put him against a volley of shots until he got into a little hill of the ranch. We looked for him everywhere. Too much we wanted to hunt him to show people this monster. I did not believe in this before, but now that I've seen it, I know there's a chupacabra. I was in fourth or fifth grade playing outside in broad daylight in my backyard when I seen a mysterious creature. The garage was detached from the house and it was cracked open at about foot level. If someone or something was inside you could only see their legs or feet. We had a big dog named Bear as well that lived in the backyard, of course. As I played with my toys near the garage in my peripheral vision, I seen someone standing in the garage. I immediately assumed this was our dog, Bear, and continued to play. Moments later, Bear came running from the field of grass behind the garage, and my brain immediately told me that what I saw wasn't our dog. I slowly turned to look up at the garage, and as my vision focused, I saw two giant human-like feet with patches of hair, but not fully covered in hair. I couldn't see its body, but something tells me it was a small creature with giant feet. As soon as I realized what I was looking at, the creature started hopping from left foot to right foot, etc., as if it knew I noticed it, though we couldn't see each other's faces. Or at least I couldn't low. My heart dropped and I ran inside to my older brother. I got on his back and we searched the garage, but nothing was there. The feet looked like the hobbits from the Lord of the Rings movie. This happened in Compton, California, United States. Not known for cryptids, but a special city indeed. Anyone know what this is or seems similar? One of my brothers called it a gnome. One evening this past summer, my girlfriend and I were driving through the Kansas countryside. After crossing a cement bridge that spanned a river, we pulled into a farmer's access road and parked at the edge of a field alongside a bend in the river with a car pointing east. Not long after we stopped, we noticed a strange light that suddenly approached our location in a quick blur. Hovering above the trees was a dark object rectangular in shape with one red and one green running light positioned together on the lower part of the craft at its center. We stared in amazement and couldn't take our eyes off the object. After five minutes or so, we noticed the craft's position had moved to the right. It seemed to move in a very slow motion to the other side of the river. After another five minutes, I decided to drive away from the area. As we turned onto the county road and subsequently onto the cement bridge, we saw that the craft had returned to its original position, above us and slightly back from the bridge. I stopped again and got out to look at the craft. The object was about 20-25 feet wide, and now I noticed a large rectangular glass window, or what appeared to be glass, running across the middle third of its front. Standing inside to the left side looking down on us were two beams, which I could see only from the waist up. 
I could tell that these beings were about four feet tall, with abnormally large heads and large black eyes. The eyes seemed devoid of emotion, and their skin was pure white, like the moon, the texture resembling that of an albino salamander. Their eyes ran almost north or south with their heads. The craft hovered silently the whole time. After about a minute of eye contact with the humanoids, I got back into the car and rapidly drove away from the area. We could still see the craft hovering where we had left it. Sometimes we both get an urge to return to the spot and just sit there and talk about our shared experience, kind of hoping these beings would stop by. In 1983, I lived in a house in Boulder with several roommates, one of whom was an airline steward. Since he was away, at times I would walk his Grand Pyrenees or Golden Lab Mix and take her for hikes with me in the foothills above Boulder. One weekend I was planning a Saturday morning hike, so on Friday I amassed things to take with the dog and me, getting my day pack all ready for the outing. Friday night, when I went to bed, however, before sleep set in, I suddenly had a vision of a Native American in an orange shirt and painted face, hovering above the Bear Canyon, or Peak Trailhead. His hair fanned out behind him in the wind. I could not see his lower body. It was more like a thick wisp of smoke coming from the ground. He communicated to me that I was not to go up that trail. If I persisted, I would meet with disaster. I sat bolt upright in bed, turned on the light, and felt quite rattled. I got up and watched TV with my roommates for a while. Eventually, I went back to bed, and the vision occurred again. Again, I was jarred by it, wondering what was going on and thinking it quite out of the ordinary. I lay awake for hours, unable to get this out of my head. In the wee hours, I finally was able to calm down and sleep. The next day, the dog and I went up into the foothills. But when I got to the trailhead, I felt as if an invisible wall were there. I just could not override the warning and ascend that trail. So we went along a different trail, and all was fine. A few years later, living in a different part of Boulder, my neighbor told me that one night in the early 80s, he felt beckoned to that same trailhead and actually got in his car in the middle of the night to drive there, parked, and hike up to the trailhead. At the time, we were having high winter winds, the Chinooks, so it was not really the best conditions in which to go out for a 2 a.m. stroll, but he was compelled to go anyway. Once at the trailhead, John felt extreme dread, as if something were lying in wait for him up that trail. He would start up the trail a few steps then, turn around and head away from it. He lingered at the trailhead for almost an hour before turning around and heading home, feeling extremely confused by the experience. Due to other experiences along the Flatterons in Boulder, I have come to believe that the spirits of Native Americans reside there. Some are protective. I have no idea what may be up that trail that may be beckoning and sinister, Native spirit or gin. I had hiked the trail before without incident before this Native American spirit warned me off it. Luckily, I was cautioned, and my neighbor had good gut instincts, so we both avoided whatever was awaiting us. It's hard to pinpoint an exact date, but I believe it was summertime in 2010. There were two separate instances that neither of us had thought were tied together. We were living in Mount Wolf at the time, right by the Cadoras Furnace, which there's a whole other story about the woman in white for another time. Behind our house were woods, and it wasn't uncommon for us to hear foxes or owls or any other animal making noise out there. But there was one night that my mom had called me outside to listen to, what she described as a sad, lonely wailing we researched endlessly about what could have possibly made that sound. But we always fell short. Just as you described it, it would fade in and out and eventually lingered away. 
I hadn't thought much on it, considering that the actual sighting was the forefront of my memories there, but reading that description, it makes so much sense. It was a little bit after this when my mom and I were coming home from running errands when we slowed to a stop right around here, below. It was nighttime, and we always liked to watch for deer on the horizon of the fields. I was in the passenger seat trying to see out my mom's window, and that's when I saw this black form by the back window. I don't even remember what I said or did to get her to look back, but she did. She then turned forward, slammed on the gas, and wouldn't even talk to me about it until we got home and in the house. She said that when she turned to look at it, it stood up and winged like appendages spanned out from its back. We both agreed it was massive. I'd say nine, ten feet. I don't recall seeing any red eyes, but it all happened so fast. Personally, I'm more apt to be spooked out by the paranormal, whereas my mom is more curious. But whatever this thing was was enough to terrify her. She wanted to go back out to investigate, but I was too afraid to go, and she didn't want to go alone. The next day, when we returned in the daylight to see if maybe there was a tree or mailbox or anything that could have been what we saw, but there wasn't. Up until now, I jokingly referred to it as my Mothman experience, despite the uneasy undertones. I had no idea this creature even existed. I've told the story to so many, but I think it's hard for them to really grasp what actually happened. To them, I'm sure it just sounds like a spooky ghost story. I've been dying to find an actual explanation to this, and I think I finally did. My grandmother had a similar experience, but she was living in Edgewood, Maryland at the time. She described it exactly the same, though a massive black winged figure lingering near her car. She told us that she thought it was a fallen angel. It's all been very surreal. I didn't think I would ever get answers to what we saw, and it's haunted me to this day. I'm still unsure whether or not this discovery has eased my mind or frightened me even more. I live near downtown Philadelphia. I always enjoyed night walks even though it was not recommended in my neighborhood. But it was the best way for me to find my peace after a long, hectic day at work. I miss those walks because I stopped taking them after I saw it. It alerted me to its presence while I was walking between two buildings. There was a quick snap, like a branch was breaking. When I turned to look, I saw its limbs. The long, somewhat humanoid arms were stretching out from behind the side of a dumpster. I could see the extended fingers with the clawed ends. I wouldn't say that I was afraid, but I did suddenly feel out of place as if I had accidentally opened the door into somebody else's house. I sheepishly said, hello. The arms jerked suddenly and there was another series of loud snaps from behind the dumpster. I realized that the snapping sounds were coming from the creature's limbs. That was when the fear crept in, but I was strangely frozen in place. As the claws returned from the shadows, they curled over the rim of the dumpster and slowly began tapping against the metal body. The creature pulled itself upright, its head peeking over the edge. It looked vaguely human-like and was shaped like a man's. The mouth hung open as if it was trying to take a breath. Then it slid back, ducking out of sight yet again. After several seconds had passed, the humanoid leaped out from its hiding place. It hunkered on the ground. Its legs were as long as its arms, and the entire body was hairless and gaunt. It looked like a corpse. It then made a sudden lunge toward me. I ran as quickly as I could while hearing the snarling and shrieks that were coming from behind me. I heard it running on the ground, but then realized that it was running on the walls. It scurried along the sides of the building like a spider. My only hope was to reach my front door before it reached me. As I approached my residence, I fumbled with my keys, but was able to unlock the door and slide into the foyer. The creature crashed against the door and banged on the frame for a few seconds before falling silent. I quickly made my way to the back door and made sure it was locked. I walked back to the front foyer. I watched the front door for what must have been hours. I knew it was still there. I could hear the barely audible breathing as it waited for me to make the mistake of checking if it had left. 
Eventually, the sun started to break through the darkness. I pressed my ear against the door, but I heard nothing. I slowly pulled the door open. The coast was clear. The creature was gone. That was the last time I took a walk in my neighborhood at night. I only walk in the daylight as I keep a vigilant eye open for anything unusual. I have no idea what that humanoid was or what it wanted from me, but I wasn't going to take any chances on finding out. This sighting happened about 15 years ago at my grandparents' house in the middle of the summer. I grew up and still live in a very rural part of West Tennessee, on a farm surrounded by fields and woods. There are about five wildlife reserves within 15, 20 minutes of my house, if that says anything about how far in the boonies this sighting took place. It was the middle of the summer and I had invited some friends over to spend the night, so about eight of us saw this and we were all between the ages of 10 and 12. We had spent our whole day playing at the creek and climbing trees. That night, at about 10 or 11, we decided to go sit in the front yard and talk so we wouldn't wake anyone in the house up by being loud. We had been outside for a while and noticed that my grandparents' dogs, who had been sitting with us, had disappeared from the front yard, and we were no longer hearing any of the normal insect noise that occurs in the south during the summer. The field across the road from the house was planted with corn, and we started to hear something moving through the corn. It started getting louder and closer, and we heard what sounded like grunting or someone breathing heavily. It was a full moon, so we could easily see everything that was in the yard and the field, which was only about 20 yards from where we were sitting at the time. We heard what sounded like a scream as something came through the corn across from us, at which point we all took off running for the house, leaving everything in the front yard. As we ran inside, I looked over my shoulder and saw what I can only describe as a huge, hairy man. His head was level with the top of the corn, which at this point in the summer was about seven foot tall. When we got inside, we all looked at each other with disbelief, asking each other what it was and agreed not to talk about it anymore. After this encounter, we would not go out at night anymore. I grew up hunting and spending all of my free time outdoors. I know the animals and sounds that are native to this area, and this wasn't one of them. I still, to this day, feel like there is something there when I visit the house and try not to stay outside too long at night. I fished commercially in the Bering Sea, Bristol Bay, and near the Aleutians for a couple years. Coolest thing was seeing a gathering of gray whales, I think, in the Gulf of Alaska. As far as the eye could see, gray whales had gathered. We were very careful to move slowly and not hit any. Strangest or most unsettling thing is when the sea gets calm and flat like a lake. On a day-to-day -day basis, any time that the main shut down and it gets absolutely quiet is terrifying. And creepiest would be shipwrecks. You'll see them all over the place. Several guys I knew looted a couple of the shipwrecks at one point or another for gear. Storms really never scared me. You just kind of get used to it, and it seems normal and at times exciting. Get it? When I was fishing, it was pre-IFQ, meaning we did that whole derby thing. So everyone was constantly exhausted. I vividly remember one time looking straight at the sun after 50 hours of work lounging on a pile of line and in between strings, and very clearly hearing someone say, Fly on me again, and I will shine on you no more. I immediately knew it was a hallucination caused by exhaustion, but creepy in the moment. My family and I have a new puppy that we take outside to walk in the middle of the night. This was around four in the morning, and she let me know she had to go out. She has always been very intimidated going out in the middle of the night, but never thought anything of it. Just as I was about to bring her inside, I hear this howl, human-sounded screech that sounded like it was right behind me. Puppy and I ran so fast in the house. The scream that came out of my body was so bizarre. 
I just froze in fear as soon as I got inside. My husband was very concerned and immediately locked the doors and brought all of our kids in bed with us low. We are trying to chalk up to maybe a fox. I would normally talk myself into it, just being an animal, but the weird vibe I got, I can't even describe it. The howl or scream sounded like it was right in my ear. I will never be going outside alone again. When I went to college, I befriended a professor of mathematics. He was one of the most intelligent, eloquent, and articulate people that I've ever known. A remarkable family man who married in his twenties with a daughter and a son. He never drank or smoked, never used drugs, never permitted himself to curse, raise his voice, or become aggressive, even in disagreements. He was always in control, always punctual and on time, always organized and very disciplined. And he wore clothing that would not look out of place at the turn of the 20th century and acted like a true gentleman. I'm just telling you what kind of man he was. Not a crazy man, not a junkie, no mental illnesses. I had the pleasure of taking advanced algebra, calculus one, calculus two, and differential equations with him. Anyway, we had this STEM club room in the math department where we students hang out to study and chit-chat. And sometimes our professor would join us for help with tutoring, homework, exam study help, and just discussions about various unrelated topics. One time he told us a story about when he something strange in the woods. This happened during the 90s when he was a teenager. He lived in Quincy, CIA during that time. And he had a hobby of driving his dad's old beat-up truck all over the Sierra Nevada mountains just for exploring and also for hunting animals and gathering wild berries. He liked following old mining roads and seeing where they led. One such time he was out looking for blackberries to pick. It was getting late and the sun had set, so he was driving down this narrow road when he saw there was an obstruction in the road. He saw it looked like someone had stretched a giant plastic bag across the road. He thought it might have been construction work or something. As he drove up to what he thought was a plastic bag stretched across the road, he stopped his vehicle within like 40 feet of it, and he saw that it was not a plastic bag. It was some kind of screen or curtain, a two-dimensional flat shape stretching over the road, perpendicular to it. It was a rectangular shape, with the width of the road and about 1.5 times in height, and he saw that it was translucent, like some kind of hologram. It was like semi-transparent because when my professor shined a flashlight through the rectangle, the light penetrated through it, illuminating the road past it, but just barely, like the light only went a foot or two beyond that screen. It was just standing or floating there, and yet it was not attached to anything. It held its own weight, but it was like weightless at the same time. Its surface was like wavy or rippling, my professor got out of the car to investigate this strange floating rectangle. He went right up to it, and as he did, it was like it was emitting a vibration or low humming that he could feel in his bones. There was an effect that the closer to the rectangle, the stronger the vibration was on the objects around it. And as he got close to it, he saw the hair on his arm standing up, like there was some kind of energy in the air. And there were dense trees on each side of the road, so he couldn't go around this rectangle in the middle of the road. He went up to the trees and broke off a branch. He then poked the branch into this rectangle, and he saw subtle ripples going up and down through the rectangle from the place where he touched the surface. And he stuck the stick all the way into the rectangle, and there was no resistance. But he didn't see the stick going through the other side of the rectangle. It was like it disappeared or became invisible. And then he pulled it out, and the stick was unchanged, not burned or deformed. Not knowing what this rectangle was, he went back to his car, continually looking at the rectangle. He didn't want to risk driving through the rectangle. So he drove his car in reverse until the road became wide enough to turn around and head back where he came from. To this day, he doesn't know what it was. 
He said it looked like a two-dimensional shape, like a semi-transparent rectangle stretched across the road, perpendicular to the surface of the road. He didn't even know how it was possible for a two-dimensional shape to be floating like that, but he saw it with his own eyes. I don't know if he ever went back there to find out. He didn't elaborate. He didn't even say where exactly this was. This was just when we were chatting in the club room after 6 p.m. doing homework or just resting and eating snacks. And I never got back into contact with him after graduating, moving out of that college town, and then the pandemic hit. I don't know, but I suspect that's one of the things that pushed him to become a professor of mathematics, seeing a rectangle in the middle of the road. That's not something that happens every day, now is it? Anyway, that's all I know. I'm writing this post while the incident is still fresh in my mind. It occurred around midnight of Saturday, September 2nd, and each day that goes by, I feel more unsure about what I really heard that night. To preface, this took place in the Olympic Peninsula, along the Hood Canal. My girlfriend's parents recently bought a beautiful riverfront property in a rural area down a private gravel road that has a few other houses here and there. Their property is heavily forested on all sides, though the neighbors' houses are vaguely visible to both the left and right. The night was winding down after watching a movie. Everyone had gone to sleep while I lay awake playing on my phone. The windows were open, letting in the pleasant sound of the river bubbling outside. Close to midnight, I started hearing splashing in the river, which startled my dog, but was easily explainable as elk or deer crossing the river since the area is very wild. However, after the splashing subsided, I started hearing a repeated animal cry that sounded like a sort of bellow mixed with a scream or yell. It's hard to remember exactly at this point in time, but it was deep, not like a cougar or fox screaming, and fast in cadence. Definitely odd, but still explainable as an animal. This happened for ten minutes or so, intermittently with what sounded like a huffing or snorting sound. I was alert at this point, listening and trying to calm my dog, who was unsettled by the sound as well. As I listened, it started moving closer, at first sounding like it was across the river, but now on the right side of the house. As it moved closer, it transformed into what sounded like a human screaming help in the most deranged, unsettling way possible. Like it was screaming help but couldn't quite form or enunciate the words correctly. It literally gives me goosebumps thinking about it right now. At this point, I was thinking what the F and woke up my girlfriend. We listened together in silence and rushed to wake up her parents when we both heard a pronounced help in the scream. Both dogs started going ballistic, and the screaming stopped at some point in the commotion, so her parents didn't get a good grasp on the sound. After shining flashlights out the windows, we went downstairs and made sure all the doors and windows were locked. After a sleepless night, we woke up and walked the perimeter of the property and found no sign of animals or humans. I was half expecting to see bloody human remains or something with how intense the screams were. I imagine that's what a person being axe-murdered would sound like. At this point, I really regret not going outside, armed, to investigate as I've spent the past two days constantly racking my brain, trying to figure out exactly WTF that was. I've looked into every animal sound out there and haven't found a single thing that actually sounds similar to what we heard that night. I'd probably think I imagined the whole thing if my girlfriend hadn't heard it as well. I'd love to hear any thoughts in, or our similar experiences from this community. There is a little hot springs nestled near the peak of the Pasameroid Pass in central Idaho. Though it is hidden in plain sight, sitting quite literally on the shoulder of the road, it is not a well-known attraction outside of the valley. But the local ranchers are quite familiar with Barney Hot Springs. It's not unusual to drive by on the weekends and see several families enjoying the water. 
Barney Hot Springs, or simply Barney's, is incredibly remote, even for Idaho standards. It's at least an hour of driving over ruddy dirt roads to the small town of Salmon to the north. If you need a hospital, it's over two hours to the regional hospital, and Idaho falls to the south. To say you're in the middle of nowhere at Barney's is an understatement. But the seclusion is one of Barney's major drawing points. That and the odd abundance of tropical fish swimming in the year-round warm waters. You can sit back, relax, and take in the surrounding views of the mighty Rocky Mountains with little in the way of distraction. But Barney's isn't all it seems to be on the surface. An event 40 years ago turned this little hot spring from a local retreat to a local nightmare. On the afternoon of October 27th, two truckers stopped for fuel at my parents' gas station and cafe in Hawaii, Idaho. They were hauling a load of hay over the Pasamaroy Pass headed for a delivery point somewhere in Utah. As the truck fueled, the two men settled down at the cafe counter and ordered coffees. Sipping his coffee, the older trucker struck up a conversation with my mother and the regulars in the cafe. He seemed a bit on edge, but was normal in comparison to his younger partner. That young man was clearly shaken and didn't say more than a quiet yes ma'am or no ma'am to my mom. He kept his attention on the cup of coffee he cradled in his shaking hands. As the older trucker and the others conversed, he brought up a peculiar event that had happened to them that afternoon. They had crested the Passamaroy Pass and were coming down into the little lost valley. As they approached Barney Hot Springs, standing in the middle of the road, was what looked to be a child. Bringing the truck to a stop, they soon realized in horror and fascination what was before them. It was not a child, but an odd humanoid creature. Its body was slim, with long, slender limbs and a squat little torso. The head and eyes were large and amphibian. Like it was not standing any taller than a preschooler, they could see its green skin shimmer in the brilliant midday sun. Dripping with water, it was clutching a large bundle of what could only be described as hundreds of eggs. The creature watched the truck come to a stop, then awkwardly walked over the rest of the road and down an embankment. It was obvious from the trail of water it left behind that it had just come from Barney Hot Springs. On the other side of the road was a small stream hidden in dense willow bushes. No sooner had the creature disappeared, the two truckers were driving away as fast as their Cummins engine would take them. My mom and a few regulars at the cafe took in the man's story with silent, somber expressions and comforting head nods. This wasn't the first time strange things had been witnessed in the little lost valley. Of course, a frogman carrying his brood certainly was the most unique story they had heard in a long time. The regulars told the trucker not to get too worked up over the incident, as it could have been the autumn sun playing tricks on their eyes. The reassurance seemed to calm the men. They finished their coffees in a few quick gulps and headed out the door. My mom and the regulars had a good chuckle over the men's story and went on with their day. The following morning on October 28th, one of the largest earthquakes ever recorded in Idaho struck the area. The Bora Peak earthquake was a magnitude 7 and could be felt hundreds of miles away. It destroyed farm infrastructure, roads and bridges. It even killed two children on their way to school when a brick building in Chalice, Idaho, collapsed on top of them. It was a horrific and frightening day for everyone in Idaho. Barney Hot Springs was not far from the earthquake's epicenter and did not escape its wrath. A couple passing visitors near the springs that morning watched in amazement as the water drained into the earth, leaving behind a stinking, mucky hole. Minutes later, to their further astonishment, the water came splashing back into the depression, but was now boiling hot. It was a truly bizarre geologic event to see. The boiling stopped immediately after the earthquake ceased, and the water at Barney's quickly cooled. It's now more of a warm springs, having permanently lost about 15 degrees of temperature after the earthquake. The frogman has been seen a handful of times since that initial sighting always near Barney's and almost always standing in the road.
I like to think the frogman was just a doting parent getting their babies out of harm's way before the earthquake struck and annihilated everything in the hot springs. Barney Hot Springs is still a widely popular spot for the locals. No one seems too bothered by the idea of sharing the water with a little odd amphibian man and his family. Someone even reintroduced the tropical fish after the boiling incident killed all of them. It remains just one of the many weird stories to come out of the Lost Rivers area of Idaho where I grew up. I was a Marine on military installation. I don't know why, but me and two of my friends decided to stay there overnight as we were shuttled from the barracks. I do remember it was late, maybe after 1, 32 a.m. One of my buddies, who had been out drinking but not excessively, we had been told not to go outside, so we had to just walk around the inside but had no contact with any of the other Marines. It was dark inside, so we were using our flashlights. I went to the bathroom, which was directly across from my room. When I came out and my buddies were not there, I began looking for them, but they seemed gone. I knew it would be bad if they drank more and became belligerent. Suddenly I saw a shadow move at the end of one hallway. Turning my light, I saw one of them hunkered down beside a trash can. He said he needed to go outside. He ate some food that didn't agree with him. He took off his pants and wiped himself with some paper towels. He was brains out. He cleaned himself up and walked toward me. Suddenly he realized he had no clothes on. This happened at the trash can, where I saw the shadow move about 40 feet away from me. Without saying anything to my friends who were caught with their pants down, I took off running toward the exit. As I got closer, I felt like somebody or something was following me fast footsteps behind me that sounded like they were wearing combat boots. How could anybody be walking around in boots that late at night? It made no sense. These heavy footfalls were definitely chasing after me now. I began screaming bloody murder as I ran around the corner and around another one, triggering my friends who, triggering their flashlights, saw me running like a maniac through the hallways. I thought I was going to die from fear. Well, maybe from fear and also from exhaustion. My two friends caught up with me when I finally stopped running. By this time, we had gotten separated from each other by about 100 or so yards. We didn't know where anything was, so we went back into our rooms and fell asleep. The next day, we were told that nobody else had gotten any sleep because of us making too much noise. Apparently, they heard us screaming, but couldn't find us because it got real dark outside and due to lights being out-ordered earlier that evening. We didn't tell anybody what had happened. It would have just gotten us into worse trouble. I think my friend said something to some of the other Marines after we got back, but nobody else saw or heard anything. This is one of many terrifying experiences that I had during my time in the Marine Corps. I don't know if this is a ghost, demon, a bad dream, or what, but I do know what I saw and heard wasn't normal, and it definitely did not feel like an ordinary night. I'm sorry if this story is butchered. I'm a terrible writer, but I felt it important to get this story off my chest. Hopefully you could wade through my bad storytelling. I crouched in the shadow of a decaying building, clutching my rifle as tightly as my trembling hands would allow. The air was thick with tension, and the taste of fear lingered on my tongue. It was the heart of the Bosnian War, and Sarajevo was a ghost town haunted by death and uncertainty. My perch offered a clear view of the desolation that stretched out before me, a fractured cityscape ruined by the ravages of war. My Navy SEAL unit and I had become guardians of this battered city, the last remnants of a once. Proud army now reduced to a desperate few. We were snipers tasked with watching over our besieged homeland, picking off any Serbian threats that dared to venture too close to our lines. The nights were the worst, dark, silent, and fraught with the unseen. It was on one of these long, chilling nights that I first glimpsed the creature that would haunt my dreams for years to come. 
I was stationed on night watch duty, my scope trained on the eerie woods that bordered the city. The trees stripped bare by winter's icy grip appeared spectral in the moonlight. Then I saw it, a shape that defied all logic and reason. Emerging from the shadows of the woods, the creature moved with a strange grace, both mesmerizing and terrifying. It was a quadruped roughly the size of a horse, yet its appearance defied categorization. It resembled a grotesque fusion of bear, hyena, wolf, and panther, all melded together into a nightmarish form. Its snout was long, resembling that of a wolf or a pig, lined with teeth that gleamed in the faint moonlight. Its ears were small and rounded, lying close to its head, in its neck was a sinewy, powerful column. But what truly set it apart was its tail, a thick, muscular appendage resembling that of a panther capable of knocking down men and animals with brutal force. My heart pounded in my chest as I watched the beast through my sniper scope. I could scarcely believe my eyes. Each of its feet confounded description. Some claimed it had cloven hooves, while others insisted that each digit was tipped with a hoof. Its claws, heavy and formidable, resembled hooves as well, and they glistened ominously in the moonlight. As I observed the creature with a mixture of terror and fascination, it suddenly let out a screech that chilled my bones. The sound was otherworldly, a haunting wail that seemed to echo with centuries of malevolence. Without warning, it bolted back into the woods, vanishing as quickly as it had appeared. I hesitated, torn between the urge to pursue this enigmatic beast and the knowledge that a Serbian sniper lurked nearby. The risk was too great, and I knew that duty demanded my attention be focused on our human adversaries. Reluctantly, I decided to remain hidden and vigilant. The remainder of that night dragged on my mind consumed by the image of the creature. My comrades dismissed my account as the product of a fatigued imagination, but I knew what I had seen was real. That night marked the beginning of an obsession, a relentless pursuit to uncover the truth about the creature that had stalked the shadows of Sarajevo. In the years that followed, I returned to those woods searching for any trace of the beast. I interviewed survivors and gathered accounts from those who claimed to have encountered it. Some believed it was a supernatural entity, a harbinger of death in a city already teetering on the brink of annihilation. But no matter how hard I searched, the creature remained elusive, a phantom of the night that defied explanation. It left me with haunting questions, a mystery that would forever remain unsolved. The Bosnian War eventually ended, and the scars of that brutal conflict began to heal. But for me, the memory of that night and the enigma of the creature lingered on, a testament to the horrors of war and the unexplained mysteries that sometimes emerge from its depths. I was just a young teenager living in Alabama in the year 2008 or 2009 when this peculiar and unsettling incident occurred. At the time, I resided with my grandmother and grandfather. I won't delve into the reasons why I lived with them, but it was during a period when we were preparing to move. Our attention was focused on sprucing up the yard, laying down new grass around the house. We had enlisted a few helpers, including my grandparents, to assist in this endeavor. Meanwhile, my younger brother and I took advantage of the situation to play in the street and explore our modest home. Our house, while not particularly large, had a cozy deck at the back overlooking a small patch of woods. As the landscaping work continued, my brother and I frolicked in the street, reveling in the simplicity of our childhood. However, an inexplicable feeling began to gnaw at me like something was amiss in the woods behind our house. It was as if an unseen presence lurked there, keeping a watchful eye on us, observing our every move. My senses sharpened and I became increasingly aware of subtle cues from the woods, rustling leaves, swaying branches, 
Was it just the wind, or was there something more to it? Approximately 40 or 50 minutes passed in this disconcerting atmosphere. Eventually, hunger and thirst pulled us back indoors where we had a meal and enjoyed some much-needed respite. When we returned to play, the eerie feeling seemed to have subsided, and the sounds that had stirred, my unease had fallen silent. The sensation was fleeting, and I brushed it aside, attributing it to childish paranoia. For the next ten minutes, my brother and I resumed our play. Then, out of the blue, my intuition once again went on high alert. This time, I stopped in my tracks and cast my gaze toward the woods. I sensed that something wasn't right, and curiosity, mixed with a tinge of fear, propelled me closer to the forest edge. Standing there, on the verge of the woods, I strained my senses, but all was quiet. The rustling leaves and swaying branches had ceased. Whatever had stirred my anxiety seemed to have retreated, leaving me with an eerie stillness. Uncertain and hesitant, I couldn't bring myself to venture deeper into the woods. I simply turned away, deciding it was best to steer clear of the area. The unsettling episode had concluded for the time being. The following day, we found ourselves nearing the completion of our yard work. The setting sun cast long shadows as it dipped below the horizon. My family was immersed in the final stages of our preparations, and I had momentarily forgotten about my disquieting experience near the woods. As my brother and I resumed our play, I strolled behind the house, oblivious to the sense of foreboding that had gripped me before. Then it happened, a chilling encounter that would forever haunt my memories. As I stood behind the house, an overwhelming sense of being watched washed over me. I slowly turned to my right and was met with a sight that defied logic and sent shivers down my spine. There, lying on the ground, was a massive, grotesque creature resembling a werewolf or an upright canine-like being. Its eyes, yellow and piercing, bore into me with an intensity that sent fear coursing through my veins. I remained rooted to the spot, paralyzed by terror as I locked eyes with this nightmarish entity. Several seconds passed in eerie silence during which time felt both elongated and compressed. My heart raced and my mind reeled, struggling to comprehend the impossible sight before me. Then, with the swiftness of a nightmare, I turned and bolted from the scene, sprinting toward the front of the house. Gasping for breath, I stumbled into the presence of my grandparents, breathless and terror-stricken. Frantically, I tried to convey what I had just witnessed, a monstrous creature with yellow eyes lurking behind our home. My voice trembled with fear as I recounted the nightmarish encounter, but to my dismay, neither of my grandparents believed my story. They dismissed my account as a product of an overactive imagination or perhaps a harmless illusion. Their indifference left me feeling vulnerable and alone, haunted by the vivid image of that grotesque figure. As they encouraged me to return to my play, I couldn't help but wonder if my experience was real or merely a trick of my young mind. Days turned into weeks, and the memory of that nightmarish encounter remained etched in my psyche. The enigmatic presence in those woods continued to perplex me leaving me with lingering doubts and a deep-seated unease. To this day, I still grapple with unanswered questions. What was that creature? Was it real, or had my youthful imagination played a cruel trick on me? Before we moved away from that place, I couldn't shake the feeling that those woods held secrets far beyond our comprehension. Even after we departed, I often found myself reminiscing about the distant sounds and fleeting glimpses I had encountered there. The woods conceal their mysteries well, leaving me with a sense of unease and an enduring fascination with the unexplained. I should share my story about the Minayuan. It was 1998 in Maui, Hawaii, and I was headed to the hotel in a shuttle service and saw this little dude sitting on a fence wire. I had to check and recheck what I was seeing, but sure as summer, this little dude was just sitting with his legs dangling. 
As we got closer, he morphed into a plastic bag stuck on the barb. I saw him a couple of more times around the island, and my wife actually thought I wasn't crazy. One day in a gift shop, I saw a keychain with a little figurine that was the dude. All excited, I picked it up and yelled to my wife across the store, It's him! It's him! The elder native that was working asked me, uh, Have you seen him? I responded, Yes, sir, several times since I got here last week. He said they were blessing my journey and reason for coming to the island, and that I was a very special and a lucky person. After talking for a little while, he decided to share with me a local custom. He said kind of vaguely, drive up the coast. You'll know when you get there. The next morning, my wife and I got up and took off on a drive up the coast to a destination we didn't know. As we drove and drove, I wondered where I was driving to. Did I pass it? When we came around a corner and on the ocean side of the road, there is a meadow and a grotto. The energy present was very nice, and I slammed on the brakes and shouted, This is it. We parked and walked into the field. The earth felt hallowed. It felt like you should not get off the path. As we walked in, we began seeing, in various sizes, stones that had been stacked in a little monolithic style. You know, like at the river, when someone stacks up a few river rocks and makes a statue. Still in awe at how many... Probably hundreds of stacks were all over, a very large area of rolling hills. As we walked along, we came to a spot that had a bunch of rocks laying in a circle that had not yet been stacked up. We walked around and all the way to the end of the trail. There was only one circle of rocks and hundreds of stacks. I knew what the circle of rocks was for. We went back and I made my own miniature stone megalithic. As I built it, I could hear them gathered around, but never saw them again. Oh, the night before we went to the gift shop, we conceived our firstborn son after a year or so of fertility issues. That's my story about the man -hewn. I'm an American veteran who retired after 23 years of active federal military service. Back in the late 1980s and early 1990s, I was a non-commissioned officer stationed in upstate New York. On the backside of this base, Fort Drum, former Griffiths Air Force Base, Lone was a nuclear storage area. This was right next to hundreds of acres of heavily wooded area. I used to work in the tower of the storage area where I controlled all the alarms and cameras. Being a nuclear storage area, there are a ton of alarms in the ground that pick up someone or something walking on the fences, picking up any vibrations. There are cameras attached to each alarm. Cameras covered every inch of the area. The first time I saw a Sasquatch, I nearly missed my pants. I was being trained as a tower operator when we received an alarm from the backside of the facility fence line. The corresponding camera came up, and there was a hand on the fence and the Sasquatch, looking straight up at the camera. The sergeant that was training me looked at the camera, and with no excitement at all, reset the alarm and went back to what he was doing. I asked him what that was, and if we were going to do anything about it. He looked me dead serious and said, I'm pretty sure that I don't need to tell you what it was, and no, we aren't going to do anything about it. I was blown away. I came to find out that this happens all the time, and no one does anything. The first day I was certified as a tower operator and working by myself, I received the same alarm. It was the same exact scenario, but I did dispatch security to the area. They arrived and could find absolutely nothing. Later that evening, I received an alarm at one of the doors inside the storage area, and there it was staring up at the camera. That means that somehow it got through the ground alarms and defense alarms without setting anything off. It was banging on a door of the bunker housing nuclear weapons. Again, I dispatched security and they found nothing. Each night we have a log that we write explaining all the events of the evening. We turn it into our command. I wrote exactly what happened and turned it in at the end of the shift. I wasn't home for an hour when my phone rang. It was my commander telling me that I needed to come back in. 
I was made to change my report, deleting any references to alarms and SAS watches. Apparently, they know about these things and don't do anything about it. I've also seen them just appear out of nowhere. They also have some ability to make you feel sick, and I think it has to do with their young ones. I think that the young ones might not have mastered some of their abilities letting themselves be seen. This is all true. These creatures are real and have abilities beyond our understanding. The government knows about them, without a doubt, and still denies their existence. They are so confident in their deception of the American people that they never even made me sign an NDA. I live in Illinois, Fulton County, Illinois, near Peking. This is a legit sighting I had on October 25, 2017. We were walking through a trail in the woods at 10 at night. While walking through, we heard a weird screeching sound, almost like a tree squeaking, which is what we thought it was, because we were in the woods, but it was everywhere we went in the woods. It was squeaking. Then we left and came back into the woods on the same trail, but it was there on the side of the trail, crouched down facing us, staring at us. It wasn't making the noise that we heard earlier, though. I think it was about five feet tall, but that's an estimate. It was crouched down. It was probably around three and a half feet tall. It was gray. My two friends thought it didn't have fur, though I thought it had really short fur. The arms were very human like. It had five-fingered hands, but the legs looked like frog legs. I couldn't see the feet, but just the shape and direction the legs were going reminded me of a frog. I couldn't recognize what the face looked like, but from what I remember, it had slanted fully black eyes. The head wasn't very large compared to the body. It was around the same body proportions as a human, but the head shape was different than a human head shape. The head shape was more square, with one point on each side of the head. I couldn't tell if they were ears or something else. The torso was covered up by the arms and legs, so I can't really explain that, but it looked muscular, unlike the alien pictures you see online where they are very skinny, like all bones. Its arms were very defined and a little muscular. It tilted its head and stared at us almost like it was in alarm or frozen and didn't make a sound. And we turned our back and ran, which was stupid, because we were in shock because no one knew what it was. But then when we looked back, we couldn't see it. I think that by us running and the leaves crunching may have startled it. After these past six years, I'm still confused as to what we encountered that night. This occurred in central Iowa at Sailorville Lake on the nights of December 14 and 15, 2017. So I was with two friends, and we had a strange encounter with multiple humanoids that we saw in the woods from our car at night. We were really freaked out and were barely talking. The only reason we were there was that we had an encounter the previous night with what we thought were multiple humans watching us for multiple hours and communicating with each other by tapping on trees in some code and making noises not dissimilar to screeches. These noises coincided when a light turned on, and at one point we stopped hearing them for almost 30 minutes. So we called a friend, and while my friend that called was whispering on the phone, we heard the communication again and whispered for him to hang up immediately, as we said that the noise stopped before he even hung up or pulled the phone from his face. We also saw multiple silhouettes walking away through the trees. We were checking out the area again after that encounter the previous night. What we saw sent chills up and down our spines. We didn't discuss it. Instead, we individually wrote down what we saw and compared it to avoid influencing each other's thoughts on what was seen. Our descriptions were all the same, with only a small discrepancy in height and different levels of detail. The height range was about seven to eight feet tall. My other friend thought it was just six feet high or so. The description that follows is the most detailed. Our friend actually got out of the car and went to the edge of the woods to listen closer. 
something none of us will ever do after seeing those eyes. There was more than one. They were positioned to our right, to our left, and straight ahead, very slender, tall, hunchbacked, and brown in color. The eyes had an orange-yellow glow, almost like cat eyes that reflect in the dark, but no lights around. The movements were precise and quiet, despite dry leaves everywhere. They each had two primary locations they went back and forth from, but they had more spots on their path. When I was outside the car, I could hear breathing. Their footsteps mimicked mine, and it only happened when I was moving or looking back to the car. They used the trees to cover the light reflection, and when we spoke, all was silent. They did not walk heel to toe, but toe to heel. Really bizarre. Their breathing was heavy through their nostrils. I have never gone back to the location and have since moved to Texas. I doubt that my friends ever went back either. Any idea what we saw those nights? Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.